Yeah, welcome to numerical methods. We are still discussing now a bit the implementation of our numerical methods. And well, a focus in our last session on implementation was to find the right structure. Yeah? So where to cut things into say separate parts. So this is maybe the single responsibility principle that drives this. You would have dedicated responsibilities, random number generation, round in motion, yeah, whatever. And which part should belong together? For example, for a model of an SDE, the specification of the numerea and the specification of the drift are maybe related in a very strong sense. So they should be in the same class. Yeah or provided by the same interface. So we already did some work here. So we introduced a structure based on these interfaces here. So there is the random variable, which is lifting all arithmetic operations on the level of random variables. So we just write in terms of random variables like we do as a mathematician and also provides handy functions like give me the expectation, the standard error, the variance. Yeah? So in case of Monte Carlo, an estimate for the expectation or the standard error. And we have an implementation. Then another nice utility was the time discretization. So we can just easily create a time discretization, specifying initial time, time step size, something like that. And from that, we could build the Brownian motion. Well, actually I did not show that, but there was another cutting. Yeah, uh, We were using the Brownian motion and provided the random number generator as an argument. So here is found in motion with a fixed specified random number generator, Mesent Vista. But there was also an implementation that consumed another interface, namely the random number generator. Okay, so you see, to, you can also later split the parts uh, again, and we did that for the Brown in motion. Then, we defined the numerical scheme. So we defined our generalized Euler scheme based on the definition of our model, the model STE. And the nice slide was maybe that one here that specified the generalized Euler scheme. So we would like to simulate an STE uh, because all the ingredients that we now structured in our implementations are here on this slide. So there was the Brownian motion, the Brownian increments that are provided by this interface and its implementations. Then of course you see there is the time discretization here, yeah, which of course enters here into the Brownian increment. All the objects written here are in terms of random variables. Actually, it's even a little bit more general. So this guy here is a random vector. Okay. And below we have our numerical scheme. So that is actually our Euler scheme that uses as an input the Brownian motion and the model parameters. And so our model parameters are the initial value of the stochastic process Y for which we are performing the Euler scheme, the drift and diffusion. And also to some extent to highlight this, the measure because we specify the numerator. And generalized um, Euler scheme because we discretized Y and then transform to the 
original stochastic process, though there was this state space transform F here. Okay, and that was our process. So the blue guy in this list. Yeah, and now I'd like to finish this session. I'd like to use now the stochastic process. So here, our yeah, final output. So this is the object that we finally generate, the time discrete stochastic process. I would, I would like to use this in valuation of a financial derivative. So we would like to talk a little bit about now the simulation model yeah, and the product, for example, I like to value an European option. So I would like to separate the model code. So the stuff that we have seen so far. So everything that we have done in the numerical methods, including now the model specifications or the parameters from the product code. And there's also maybe some other motivation behind this, because if you look into what happens in industry, then development cycles of the two things are maybe a little bit different. Uh, so it may be that you have a new financial product that has only a slight modification in its payoff function yeah, or a slight change in the feature very often. Yeah? So there's a request, okay, I like to change something. So it's just a function that depends on the simulated quantities and the function changes. So you would like to create new products that could rely on the generated um, X value. Uh, so that's the model part. And I do not need to regenerate a new model for this. With respect to models, so sometimes things happen in the financial market or you observe that your model does not calibrate well. Yeah? A nice example is maybe that suddenly interest rates become negative. And if you have worked with an interest rate model that assumes positivity, then okay, this model is no longer a good model. So you have maybe to introduce a new model. But these development cycles are usually a bit longer or maybe maybe different. Yeah, they also require much more testing. You, know? you have to check that everything is nicely calibrating, converging, and so on. So I like to separate the model part from the product part. So the product code is the one, the algorithm that generates the final function V, uh, the value of the financial product. So I'd like to separate this in my design. So we are now back to our application, the universal pricing theorem. I have a model that describes me the market in terms of an STE, uh, under the equivalent martingale measure. So that is in the background, assuming that I perform replication, I perform hatching to replicate the value of the financial derivative. And I have the financial derivative specified here as a function of these simulated quantities. Okay, and then in the end, uh, the value is given just by taking the expectation. So for example, using our Monte Carlo method. If you now go back to our slide where we composed all the numerical methods into some implementation, or for example, here, our slide with the generalized Euler scheme, then there's a small problem. Um, our Euler scheme and all the numerical stuff, so the stuff that is here below should be general. Yeah, I do not want to write new numerical implementations uh, whenever I have a new model. So we have a Brown in motion, we have an Euler scheme and all that stuff is completely independent from the current ap uh, application. So it's even not uh, clear if X is something related to financial derivatives. We could use the simulation for 
any other application. The model part has a certain interpretation. So it's maybe a Black Schultz model. In this case, the X is maybe the stochastic process for the value of a stock. Or it's maybe a Hull White model. In this case, the X is maybe the stochastic process for the short rate, for the interest rate. Or it's um, a term structure model. Then X is the forward rate. So the interpretation, the meaning of the X depends on the model. But when we go step by step through all these guys here, then it's maybe no longer clear when we have performed the numerical simulation what the X is. So we have a small problem. What is the interpretation of this X that is generated by our Euler scheme? So my model defines the process X and also the numeraire. So the model knows about this. The model knows the interpretation, but my numerical scheme, my Euler scheme, which provides the numerical approximation, it does not know what the interpretation of the X tilde is. But when I would like to separate the code between the simulated quantities and finally the financial product, then I have to define an interface that clearly says, okay, what's the object uh, I would like to use in the evaluation. So there will be some method that is called get the value of the stock, get the value of the interest rate, get whatever. And then I can use these quantities um, in my valuation code. So I have to wrap these two guys, yeah? uh, actually really the two guys, because this guy here is providing the X, but recall that when we go back to the slide here, this guy here should provide the numeraire. Yeah? And for derivative evaluation, I need the numeraire, but the numeraire is also a function of the simulated quantity. So we need to go back a little bit through this model and provide now the simulated quantities under the right name. So it's just a small, tiny wrapper. We provide them under the right name and uh, then can use this in derivative valuation. So before I show you how my implementation looks like, yeah, just maybe a few examples. I already mentioned some, for example, for a Black Schultz model, a Bachelier model, the interpretation of the X is the stock value. For the Heston model, actually the interpretation of the X is that it is, is a vector. The first component is still the value of the stock. The second component is the stochastic process describing the instantaneous variance, log variance of uh, the process. So you have here this second stochastic process that models the stochastic volatility. Yeah? So you see the sigma parameter here in this model is now um, a stochastic process. My sigma is just the initial value of the stochastic process. That's um, a model. And now I have to know, okay, the first component of this vector is the S. Or um, other cases are um, interest rate models yeah, where the X has a completely different interpretation. So I combine now the two guys, my model and my process in a class that implements an interface that provides these things under a meaningful name. 
if I have this, then I can implement the product valuation. So for the product valuation, it's now just a function that gets this interface, the interface that provides the X and the N, but the X is now provided under a meaningful name. We will have a look at this interface yeah, in a few seconds. Um, so the product valuation is then just implement the function. Yeah? For the European option, it's just maximum of S minus K and zero multiplied with N of little t divided by N of capital T. Yeah? So you see um, it's here this function for European option with this special function on, on S. And you see that the two quantities, the S, which is the first component of my X vector in Black Scholes and Heston, um, and the N enter into this function. So I just need to implement this function. For the product valuation, I do a little um, generalization. Um, I do not return in this uh, valuation function. So here is my valuation function. I do not return the value, the expectation of that. So the value, the expectation of that, yeah, like in the universal valuation theorem. What I return is just the random variable that sits here inside. So I just return this random variable, V star. So you still need to take the expectation. That's just a minor detail, but sometimes it's nice to still have the full random variable. For example, control variants, our next topic uh, is an application where it's nice to still have the full random variable because then you can still calculate the standard error or covariances or whatever. So just a minor detail, we implement then the product valuation uh, is this function. So maybe just review these two guys. So I review now the wrapper that combines the simulated X with the model to provide numeraire and the simulated quantities under meaningful names. And I then use this in different uh, financial products. Okay, so maybe we can just have a look at this. And then also play a little bit during the evaluation. So you see there is a section here as a derivative valuation. So in the Monte Carlo section, I have models that are related to single assets, yeah, like Heston, Bachelier, Black Scholes. Uh, there are also models that are related to interest rates. So interest rate models like uh, Hal White, uh, labor market model and so on. Okay, so maybe we stick a little bit to the simpler world of a single asset model. Um, this here is our model specification, the parameters, initial value, mu, lambda, and so on. But you see there is this interface asset model, Monte Carlo simulation model. So now simulation model means it combines the model and the simulation. So maybe an ugly long name. Okay. And it now specifies that the X, my X value should have a meaningful name, namely just get asset value. And if it is a model that provides multiple assets, then you can also provide an index. Okay, and then it provides also the numeraire. So the task we have to do is, when we call get numeraire, we have to ask our model, okay, how is the numeraire calculated for this? And when we ask, give me the stock, give me the S, then I just map to the right value of the X. So an implementation of this guy, which is, which is um, suitable for Black Scholes, Bachelier, Heston, yeah? all the guys which have the S in the first component is this one here. So maybe let's look at this, the next one here. So you see 
it now gets as members my model, the one that I always marked with light blue, and our Euler scheme, the process, the one which I always marked with green. So the constructor just needs the process because the Euler scheme was created with this model. So the Euler scheme knows the model. So I can ask the Euler scheme what model was used. Yeah. So there's just a single nice constructor that is asking what model was used. And this is also nice because now you see all the steps I'm doing are building on each other. Yeah. So we have a time discretization. I have a Brownian motion that uses the time discretization. Then I have the model, the blue guy, that is just the specification of the parameters. Then I have the Euler scheme that uses the true above the Brownian motion and the model. And now I have this guy that uses the Euler scheme. And this guy can ask, okay, what model was used? So this guy now knows the two parts. So if I'm asking here for the stock, I'm routing to the process yeah, and I'm getting the first, or if it's multiple, the second uh, component. So I'm just wrapping this. This is just a wrapper to provide this stuff under a meaningful name. But what happens for the numerea? So the numerea is known to the model. Yeah? If you make change of numerea, then the model has to provide a different drift. So the numerea is known to the model. So I ask the model, okay, give me the corresponding numerea. You see that the numerea has the stochastic process as an argument, and that might maybe puzzle you because actually it's not needed. If you look here at the Black-Schultz model, that's the implementation of this model, and you go to the line where we provide the numerea, you see the numerea doesn't use this argument. It's not used. It's just e to the rt. Yeah? e to the rt is the numerea in the Black-Schultz model. However, there are other models where the numerea depends on the simulated x. An interest rate model where the interest rate, so the r is stochastic, is clearly an example. In that case, I need to know the simulated x. So you see that my numerea is actually a function of the x. So if I go back to the slide and you specify here the numerea, then the numerea is a function of x. So it's a function of x, but in my simulation, of course, it's a function of the simulated x. So that's why the process is an argument to the numerea. So what the model is hence providing is the map x maps to n of x to l. So the model is providing this map. That is what I'm providing here. And some models do not have this dependency. Yeah, you can maybe look it up in interest rate models. Okay, maybe look at the hull white model, the numerea of the hull white model. Okay, so you see the stochastic process enters here and clearly the numerea is a complicated function of this process. Okay, so you can have very complicated numereas. Okay, so now I have this nice interface which provides S, the stock, and N, the numerator, and I define all my valuations in terms of these quantities. So I can now define all kinds of financial derivatives. Let's have a look at, for example, the European option. So these are my models. These are my financial products. So there is a European option here. The European option has as parameters, the maturity, the strike. Okay, so you have a nice constructor using these tools. And the valuation is now defined as a function of this model interface. So you see this model here is just the interface that provides the S and the numerator. And 
if we would like to do weighted Monte Carlo because it is a Monte Carlo simulation, it also provides the weights. Yeah, but that's maybe just a minor detail. It provides the S and the numeraire. And we can now write the valuation in terms of these quantities. So I asked the model, give me the S at the maturity. Then I apply the payoff function. So maximum of S minus K, so S minus K, and then floor at zero, that's maximum S minus K and zero. Uh, so here now model means this simulation model, yeah? the combination of process and model. Yeah? That's maybe, maybe not so good that I here use also the word model, but on this abstraction level, uh, I have for, actually forgotten about all the other guys. So then uh, I ask for the uh, numeraire at maturity. I divide by the numeraire at maturity. I ask for the numeraire at evaluation time. I multiply with the numeraire at evaluation time and I return the value. And if you now take the expectation of this random variable, though that was here the remark that I just return this guy here inside. If you now take the expectation, then you see uh, the value of the option. Yeah, so maybe, maybe you also look at the Asian option so that you see there's also a guy that is a little bit more complicated. So Asian option is actually an average of different stocks and then an option on the average. So there is a time discretization for the averaging. And then the get value method that just uses the model as an input, yeah, it's just slightly more complicated. I'm asking here my simulation model for the different S's at the averaging time and I calculating here the average of these random variables. And you see all this stuff here is on the level of random variables. Yeah, so I'm, I'm averaging now pathwise the random variables. And then I take the option and again do the numeraire n of little t divided by n of capital T and return the value. There are also more complicated financial products like a Bermuda option here as um, example, examples. So then that's finally, yeah, the last step in my design here. So now you have here an example how the derivative valuation would look like now, okay, if you would like to value an option using a Black-Scholes model, these are the steps, yeah. So first we define the model with its model parameters, doesn't actually know how it will be implemented. Then we define the time discretization that we would like to use for the Brownian motion, which is then defined here. Okay, we could define the random number generator separately. Then we define that the Euler scheme should use that model and that Brownian motion. So you see here as an input, it's the Brownian motion and the model, okay, then I have the simulated quantities X, yeah? but okay, I do not know the interpretation of these quantities. Then I wrap them in this simulation model. So it just uses the simulate process, but the simulated process also knows inside which model was used. Then I define my financial product, or all the financial products I would like to value against this, this model. That, that's it. So to conclude maybe this session, yeah, maybe I don't implement this now, we can just walk through the code a little bit, but we could also go back to the example we had at the very beginning. So at the very beginning, I had this example where I showed you Monte Carlo valuation of a European option under a Black Shorts model. So that was here, our model parameters, 
the product parameters and the Monte Carlo parameters uh, in different ways. Yeah? So we had as a benchmark the analytic value because for this simple model, there was an analytic formula. We could write just the loop directly. Yeah, Everything cluttered together. We could structure it a little bit better using functions for the model and the product, and then using the streams API. Or we could use our classes, the time discretization and the Brownian motion, but then calculate the model and the product on the random variables without this additional separation into model and product. Okay, and as a last step yeah, of my abstraction, I now replace this blue part by a corresponding model and then uh, an Euler scheme simulation and a wrap up in the simulation model and then using my European option. Okay, and these are the steps yeah, that you also just saw. Okay, I specify the model, the time discretization, the pawn in motion, the Euler scheme. I wrap it up under an interface that could be used by the financial product to calculate the value. Uh, well, here you see, I just have a method get value that returns a, a floating point number. Actually, before I said, okay, it is a little bit uh, general, but that's just, um, yeah, a shortcut. So actually here, the European option also, of course, has an interface. Yeah? I like the interfaces. So it is this abstract asset Monte Carlo product. And if you would like to go down, there's even a more simpler interface. So you could here on the left-hand side also just write that this is just an any product. Yeah? And I just know that any product provides a function to calculate the value. And then you see it doesn't provide this function. The function it provides is the function that I have on my slide. So I have to provide the um, the initial time at which I would like to evaluate this and the model. So that's my Plex Scholz Monte Carlo simulation. And then you see this guy here now returns the random variable. So he's now complaining. So I have to get the expectation. And from that, I return the double value. Okay, that's maybe a bit more lengthy. Okay, so you see, I have here another guy in this experiment and now I can run all these different um, implementations. Okay, and a little surprise, yeah. My implementation that uses here this very high level of abstraction yeah, is even the fastest one. Okay, so that's because I can do some optimization under the hood, uh, hidden from you. Yeah? So writing short code uh, is not necessarily uh, slow. Yeah? You can provide here this, this nice level um, of abstraction. This here is a little bit stupid example yeah, because I mean, I'm doing here an Euler scheme, but I just have one time step. Okay, that's a stupid example. Uh, in the script, this example here is actually this unit test here, which you also find in our library. So when I when I when I talk about our library, I mean here our library, which you of course find here on, on GitHub, so our Finmat lab. Yeah? And uh, there are many other stuffs included. So we are maybe a little bit at the Monte Carlo simulation yeah? and just use, uh, look at a few, a few models. So you find there, this unit test and this unit test is now using 
an Euler scheme with multiple time steps. So maybe you can also play with this guy. So that these unit tests are here in the separate folder source test. And there you find at some place the Monte Carlo Black Scholes model test, where I use here 20,000 simulation paths and for example, 10, 10 time steps, right? Uh, I have also this more direct way of the calculation and I have the product implementation as we have just discussed this. And maybe you can, you can, you can run this one. Oh, what's wrong here? Oops, I, I, I ran all the unit tests. No, 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 I do not want to do this. <laughs> stop, please stop. So I just want to run this, this single one here. Okay, so you see that's an example with different parameters and you can, you can maybe play a little bit with this. Yeah, okay, so let me show you a last thing, yeah. So here I have the same thing as a small main method, so we can run it, yeah, and just see, we will get a Monte Carlo valuation of an option now with these parameters here using 10 time steps and if you would like to visualize, for example, your simulation passes, that's possible here using, we define a double two random variable functions. So these are maybe the process simulation path. Uh, it maps time to, I ask now my Plex Schultz model for the asset value at that time. Yeah, so I just have one asset, so it's asset with index zero. And then I have a small helper. A small helper that allows to plot a process with a given time discretization. This process and the number of sample paths I would like to show in this plot. So here I say that we just need to show the first 100 sample paths. Maybe I let this guy run now. Okay, and you see that you have your Black Schultz model sample pass. And now you can play around and change all kinds of things. Yeah. For example, let's have finer time steps in my Euler scheme. Yeah. 100 time steps with 0.05 time step size. So this is an option that has maturity five. So it should run two, five years. Yeah. So now it runs a little bit longer. Yeah. And you see you have finer time step size, similar value. You can also change now maybe the model. Yeah? So let's change the Plex Schultz model here to a Bachelier model. Okay, so if I change this to a Bachelier model, I have to be careful because now the volatility parameter has a different interpretation. It's the sigma of the Bachelier model. If you just keep this interpretation, the value before was a 26, yeah, the option value was a 26 for the Black Schultz model. I will get a completely different value now here. So you see 18, the Black Schultz model is like that. And that looks quite strange, okay. So it has almost no volatility. The volatility is too small, but if you scale this uh, volatility, not with the initial time, with the initial value, 
if you scale it, then it's a little bit similar to the sigma times s in the Black Schultz model. Then the Bachelier model is maybe for this option here already more similar to the Black Scholes. Yeah, you see, you get here a 28. Black Scholes has 26. Yeah, so analytic valuation is still here, Black Scholes. Um, and yeah, this looks more like a normal process. Yeah. Black Scholes would be log normal. Okay, so you see, I can very quickly switch between different models. And of course, you can also quickly switch between different products. Yeah, that was, that was it here on my little session on the implementation. And my next session is variance reduction using Monte Carlo control variance.